irrevocable trust. trust. I see. Yeah. Whereas with a different example, like if my dad lends me his car, or if the parents leave the kid with the babysitter, they want a revocable trust because if they don't like the way the trustees behave, and they want, you know, my dad wants the car back, or the parents want the kid back, and they want to collapse exactly. the trust. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> is that right? Yes, exactly. Okay, so it depends what we're trying to achieve, whether we whether it's going to be a revocable or irrevocable trust. Yeah, so we start breaking it down. So now we got to separating the revocable and irrevocable. Right. And I think a lot of people are probably talking about revocable trust, but that grantor has a lot of flexibility to move around. But an irrevocable trust, once he gives up um, control, that's it. There is no going back. Now all control is with the trustee, hmm. and that's it. So he can maybe go to move to the beneficiary, but he can't go back to being grantor because gotcha. it's done. Um, I've got a question. Sorry to keep loading with questions. Um, I've heard of scenarios where the grantor can tr uh, can become the trustee for the benefit of another. So you can you can be the grantor trustee for someone's benefit. Is that right? Ir irrevocably. Irrevocably. It depends. Now it depends what kind of irrevocable trust you're talking about. If you're talking about irrevocable common law trust. It can be done, but usually you have to wait about a two-year period where it can be shown that as the grantor, you have enough control or um, you're a student enough to make, take care of it like that. Right. And there has to be another grant. There has to be another trustee involved. Oh. So there needs to be. Um, there's something called an adverse trustee. This is where the trustee has more interest than the grantor originally had. Oh. So that he cannot be controlled. Ah. So adverse trustee especially from a tax purpose, then it's more a uh, more properly set up trust. Right. I, yeah, I see what you mean. So, yeah. So if I was trying to protect assets from the from the IRS and I, and I said, right, here's a pile of money. I'm putting this in trust and I'm the ben I, I'm the trustee for the benefit of my mum or something. Mm -hmm. Then that's a bit dubious because I, it's it's like I'm still controlling the money. It's a bit dubious. Exactly. So so you're saying that you need you need another trustee who's got more control than you have. Yes, interest. More. So that way, you know, he has more interest than you. So it's it's in his best interest or her best interest to make sure the trust is doing good and that the grantor cannot control the trustee. Right. So that's what you call a dummy trustee. So there's a trustee in place to look like a trust, but the grantor is ultimately in control. They had this problem with the Rockefellers, <laughs> and they had a lot of dummy trustees because the trustee was an employee of the Rockefeller. Right. So they this is working. this is like how rich people do their asset protection, right? Exactly. They set up a bunch of dummy trustees, but in actual fact, the trustees do as they're told by the original grantor, but there's no record so, of that. It's, yes, that that's where, and this is where we get into the reason why people don't know about trust. Yeah. Because what happens was there was a, a lot of abuse of trust for that exact reason and other reasons too, but the uber rich mm. were using trust and they gave it such a bad name that the common people didn't want anything to do with trust because it was synonymous with corruption. Mm. Yeah. So when you had trust synonymous with corruption and the, you know, people being honest, people like, I don't want anything to do with the trust. And then it kind of just faded away in the education when trust was more common thing. So now we come to today, but that was reverse psychology. That was done on purpose. Mm. So now no one knows about trust. Lawyers don't know about trust. Mm. People, you know, it's very hard to find trust information. So when I hear people talking about trust, 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 I've been searching for almost three years to find solid trust information. And I'm telling you, it is hard. Mm. So anyone talking about, oh, this is how the trust works. And, blah, blah, blah. and I'm like, no, you know what? Unless you spent a long time looking for that information, I, you're pretty sure you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> there, are, there is some good sources out there, like, um, what is it? Not, it's not Burton's. Um, Gilbert. Gilbert on trust, but he's more talking about trustees, if you really dig into it. He talks about the rules, what a trustee can and can't do, and things like that. And it talks about the trust, but it doesn't talk about how to set up a trust and all the different types of trust, and it doesn't go into really, really detail about it. But it is a good resource, but that's one of the free resources out there. But if you start looking beyond that, you're not going to see much. You're going to see the same basic information. You're going to get these articles that are maybe four or five pages long that say the same thing over and over again. The trustee and the grantor and the beneficiary can do this, and you have very vocal trust, and they're so great, and pay us $300 to get it started. <laughs> That's where you get cut off. Your... Yeah. Pay us the money, and we'll show you how to get it started. Then there's another website. It's like NACAS or something like that, and 
they're talking about fifty thousand dollars and twenty thousand dollars to help you get started with trust. And they have these diagrams and things to show you how the trust works and sets up. And those are the same people who work with the Goober. I think Goober is a part of that group about trust. And that's where I see, like, if you're just on the surface level, that's where your trust information ends. And I've been looking for three years, and I'm real good at researching. And so most people talk about trust, 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 they have no idea what they're talking about. Mm. Or they do, let me correct, they, they have an idea of what they're talking about, but they don't have a deep understanding of trust. Mm. Which comes to the next really important question, how much knowledge about trust do you really need to have? Mm. I've got a question. Can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I keep hearing people say, I appointed the judge as the trustee, or I appointed the attorney as the trustee to settle the matter. What do they mean by that? And what do you think of that? I think there's, there could be two things going on. Because if you look at, um, as uh, you have the attorneys and you have the judge, then there's you. So if you're appointing people, well, you can appoint, if you ever, if anyone follows Winston Shroud, you can appoint the attorney as a fiduciary debtor. But why? It goes back to why. So if I'm just turning around appointing people and things are going on and I think I got it figured out, well, do you really understand why you haven't figured out or is there something else going on in the background that you're not paying attention to? Hmm. So with the appointment of fiduciary debtor or appointment of fiduciary, because attorneys have benefit of office, they must accept the position because they operate off a letter of mark. So if you listen to Winston Stroud, he goes into the history about that. And um, a letter of mark is when, like, if you are an enemy of the United States and you're waving your British flag, as a pirate, I have a letter of mark, so it just says, anybody waving a British flag, go loot and plunder and bring me back a percentage of what you got and you can keep the rest. Mm -hmm. And attorneys do that. They go out and they attack the citizens. And, you know, it's all because all citizens are enemy of the state based on the enemy of the state act. Mm -hmm. So if I say, well, you're the trustee to handle the matter and I'm talking to an attorney. Well, then, yeah, he's he has to accept that. And the only way he cannot accept it, the only way he can get out of it is to turn in his bar cart. There are other mm -hmm. ways of trying to weasel the way out of it but because they have benefit of office and they are paid by the people. Ultimately, then they can't get out of it. So, so ultimately, they are public trustees because they're public servants because they're paid by the public. Exactly. And so, so do, do you mean like one of the, one of the people's a beneficiary? So, if the beneficiary is asking them to do something, they've got a duty to do it as the trustee. Is that what you mean? Uh, yeah. If 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 the if they have a if if they've been appointed fiduciary to handle the matter, then what are they? You no, know, we have to always take it in context. We can't ever take trust in court out of context. So what are we asking for? We have an issue that says a credit card debt. We're saying, well, you're the fiduciary, so you take care of it. Now it's all on him. Right. Because if you try that with the judge, it won't work. You can't assign a judge as fiduciary. But you can say, well, you're the trustee and you're this, and you're the beneficiary now. And it all depends on what position you need to be at the moment. Hmm. Because they say, oh, you should, all, you should never be the trustee. Well, why? Sometimes I want to be the trustee. It all depends on the situation. It must be put into context. And sometimes I want to be the beneficiary. Okay. okay. So, it all, so you got to figure it out where you want to be at the best position at the moment for that situation. So could you give us an example of a type of situation where you'd want to be the beneficiary and a type of situation where you'd want to be the trustee? Um... It just in general, if I want to be the beneficiary, it's like some people, um, you don't have a job. You need to get um, <laughs> an unemployment check. Yeah. I don't mind being a beneficiary because I got no money coming in anyway. Right. So that could be one position until I get my shit together and then I can get out of that position. Because being beneficiary has a lot of rules. I've never had unemployment, but I've, my friends who do, they actually tell me the rules that are involved with it. And it's a lot of rules that you can't do this. And if you do make some money, you can't make more than this. Otherwise, they'll cut you off. And if you do this, they'll cut you off. Right. Everything you do, you pretty much got to be useless yeah. to be an unemployment check. And it almost forces you to. Hmm. And in a point where I want to be trustee, um, let's say if I'm trustee and you have a house and we're doing like a mortgage deed, then someone could assign, you can assign me as a trustee instead of assigning the bank as a trustee. So that way, if anything comes, any problems start to arise, I as a trustee can help you out so, instead of the bank's trustee right. foreclosing on your ass. So as a trustee, you've got a right to administer, you know, what's going on. Exactly. So you're, you've got a right to intervene and kind of do stuff. You've got to have control. Right. Exactly.
Actually, I, I know I've already said this already, but it was only recently that I really realised that a beneficiary doesn't just have rights, they can also have duties, like you were just saying, you know, you can you can get the benefit, like the welfare check or whatever, but there's also rules and duties and obligations that you've got to adhere to. I think I think that's some something people forget sometimes. They kind of they kind of get carried away. Like I'm a beneficiary, forgetting that there's there's also obligations. So like, if you take like an educational trust, hmm. that as a beneficiary, we will give you money for your education, but you have to maintain straight A's. Hmm. So think of like a scholarship is a benefit privilege. Right. If you get a scholarship. Once that, if you don't follow the rules, you have your obligations, you have to do this, you have to do that, then you get the benefit of the money once you um, satisfy the, the rules and you maintain them. Right. But if you don't, then cut. So, so a beneficiary can have duties as well as rights, but can a trustee have... They have privileges, not rights. Ah, well, okay. All right, then. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, Okay. Um, can a tr does that mean a trustee, as well as duties, can a trustee also have privileges or rights as well? With yes, because the indenture. See, this is um, the reason people have a hard time giving up control or dealing with trust is because they give up control. And a lot of people have a hard time giving that up. So if you want to be a grantor and you want to do this as a trust because you know the you see the benefits, but you don't want to give up control. Well, all you have to understand is that the indenture is where you have the final word. So as a trustee, you know, we have the board of trustees and they can alter your, your indenture, but they cannot change the intent. So as long as you're very clear on what the intent is, they can never change that, but they can move and shift around it to change the direction of the trust as long as it's within your intent. Uh -huh. So if you write your indenture out to my crystal clear, very, very detailed, then you don't have to worry about losing control because you kind of set it on autopilot and said, all right, I want this airplane to go north and north only. Well, they may have to veer a little east and a little west to go around some objects, but they have to keep going north. Right. That's what I put in the indenture. So right. you can have your control there. So a well-written indenture, a specifically well-written indenture, is going to be better. Than something vague. Than something vague. Because if you're vague, then it might not be clear what you intended, and then they could get away with doing something. And that's and... when the court actually steps in. And when they, if, this prob if there's an issue with the, your indenture, and it's not sure what's going on, a court may step in and say, well, this seems like to be what the indenture is about. Then you start right. getting into court-appointed attorney, court-appointed trustees, and that's where it gets into the weird situations. Right. It's so, that. So, like, a good example would be a badly written will. Yeah, exactly. Right. And then the judge has to try and interpret what what the testator probably intended and yep. try and do justice, you know, for what's fair type of thing. So like a, a well-written indenture is going to be about 30 pages. Right. <laughs> so it's not an easy. So people want to, oh, trust, trust, trust. And if you want to set up a real trust, not just make up this thing called an implied trust, mm. then it's going to take time. You really have to think about who is going to be your trustees, what is your intent? What rules do they have to follow? And you know how how is this thing going to play out? Hmm. And you have to think about that. And after who's your then you have what's called a protector, and a protector is pretty much the cop. He watches the trustees to make sure that they follow the law, which hmm. is the contract. Hmm. So you have your protector, and if something starts getting crazy, the protector steps in first. Hmm. And if you don't have a protector, then the courts will step in. And all trusts are under equity equity law. Hmm. So if you do that, you start having issues if you don't set it up properly in the beginning. Hmm. And if the beneficiaries try to attack the trust because they don't feel the trustee is doing something, then you have another issue if you don't write in a spendthrift clause in there. So if the beneficiary wants to say something bad, you just, they've just gone out the trust. So these are little things you may not even think about if you're trying to set up a real trust. And then you get these like packages online that don't give you nearly enough information. You think, oh, I got a trust set up. And you know, it just takes one little knock at the door and your whole thing is falling apart. Right, right, right. That reminds me, when you were saying like the person who's policing the trustees, that reminds me of a bankruptcy scenario. Because I was reading the Bankruptcy Act in here, here in England. And I don't know if this is the same in the States, but the trustee, there's like a board of, I don't know, like a board of creditors that makes sure... They review what the receiver is doing, or something, or they hold them accountable, or something, or something like that. Is that is that type of similar thing? I to think what um, I, have, I haven't I haven't read the bankruptcy act, 
but it's pretty much a similar thing because when you're in bankruptcy, it's kind of backwards. Bankruptcy is actually.